Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Cassandra Malice, and I am a program manager at Craft. Um, and we are very excited to start presenting this um, grains webinar series to you all. Um, I just wanted to do a quick welcome and some other um, logistical information before we jump right in today. Um, so we are recording this webinar. And so if you want to reference it later or um, want to go back and uh, you know, share it with someone else, it should be on the craft website within the next week or so. Um, we will email everyone who's registered when the recording is live. Um, we also ask that you use either the Q&A function or the chat to ask questions to Rachel throughout her presentation. Um, we will be uh, referencing that and um, you know, Rachel can ask questions as they come, but we also have reserved time at the end for Q&A. Um, we also have, you might have seen in the slides if you joined early, we have um, a number of other webinars in this Grains webinar series. Uh, tomorrow, Rachel is doing part two to this one, which is on marketing local grains. Um, but we also have on July 19th, um, Brewing Local with John Trogner from Trogues Independent Brewery. Um, on July 26th, we have Know Your Malt with CNC Malt. And on August 2nd, we have Recipe Development with Local Grains with Erica Bruce um, from Le Bogato. And so I will put the chat to register for the, all the remaining webinars. I'll put the, that link in the chat for you all. Um, and lastly, um, we at Craft just recently launched the Commonwealth Grains Community, which is a informal community for grains industry members across the state of Pennsylvania and also in the tri-state region to connect, network, um, learn from each other and learn about educational opportunities such as this. So I will also put the chat to register or to join that community. Um, I'll put the link for that as well in the chat. Um, and without further ado, I, I will turn it over to Cal and Rachel to introduce themselves and we will, uh, we will get this going. Thank you all so much for joining. Um, hi everybody, my name is Cal Norman. I am a uh, for going into second year student at Chatham University and I also work in the food innovation lab at Kraft and uh, I'll be the student moderator here and we're super excited to talk to Rachel. Um, Rachel, do you wanna uh, get us started? Yeah, absolutely. Kella, thank you so much. Um, really happy to be here with Chatham and Kraft today. Um, so I'm a food industry professional that's really specialized in brand. I'll take you a little bit into more of my background in, in just a moment as we dive into branding grains, branding local grains. Okay, great. So um, what we can do today, you know, again, thanks everyone for joining. I'm going to share a PowerPoint presentation. Um, and as it was referenced before, please feel free to um, enter questions in the chat. If you have a pressing question, you know, raise your hand, we can go ahead and, and address that right away. But I'll do about 30 minutes of a formal presentation or so, and then we'll have about 15 minutes or so at the end for question and answer. All right, so let's just get started here. Okay, great. So again, my name is Rachel Graper. Um, whenever I'm doing any kind of presentation, I like to start by just sharing my email address. So if you have any questions that might come up after the presentation, um, don't hesitate to reach out at rachelgraper at gmail.com. Um, today, we'll be talking about branding local grains. Um, to just kick this off, the reason why we're talking about branding today and marketing tomorrow is that often, you know, I feel I, I've been a food entrepreneur myself, um, I've been a professional brand marketer. And often when we start thinking about how to get the word out about our food businesses, uh, before you have to spend a dollar, it's really clear that you take a moment to, whether it's a brand new business or something that's been around for 15 years, you take that time to say, is the message that I'm communicating about my brand clear enough that it can resonate? Um, doesn't matter how much money you put behind an unclear message, that's not going to reach your consumer. So this is really foundational what we're gonna focus on for this hour. All right, and, and just to go over that again, for the next hour until about 1 p.m., we'll be talking about branding. And then tomorrow, please join us again. Uh, we'll have a more uh, question and answer period to just talk about marketing in general and marketing tactics and executions. Um, so please join uh, for that as well. All right, and as promised, just a little bit about me. So I am a, a 
brand marketer. Really, that's the heart of what I do. Um, I have pretty broad industry experience. Uh, that's because I started, I have an undergraduate degree in hospitality. Uh, right now I'm based in New York City, but I'm also a Pittsburgh native. Um, I have myself been a participant in a lot of chat and programming and um, you know, have a bachelor's degree from NYU. And then I also had, got my master's degree in business um, right there in Pittsburgh at Carnegie Mellon. Um, so in particular, I spent um, several years working on, I started my own uh, grain-free granola brand, um, very related to grains, in fact, right? Just a different way to achieve granola. I'm gonna talk about that and show you some examples later on. Um, and then also um, just this past winter season, I partnered with a, a friend who is a, the executive chef at a former chocolate company I worked at, Max Brenner. And we created this really high-end gift boxes together. It was really based on an insight about consumer needs that in the pandemic, this past you know, Christmas holiday season in particular, we knew that families and friends weren't getting together. So we made some really high touch handmade gifts that could be sent around the country with handwritten notes to kind of mimic that sort of um, special gift giving feeling that we wanted. Um, but underlying all that, I've also spent about four years working at Heinz. I worked a similar amount of time at this chocolate company, Max Brenner. It was also a restaurant. And I used to lead the international marketing department at GNC in Pittsburgh as well. Uh, so that's about me. All right, so let's dive right in. You know, the first thing I want to do is really define brand and branding just to get us started. So um, I really like this quote. I don't know Heidi Cohen. So uh, just put that out there, Heidi, if you're listening. Thank you. you she, uh, you can follow up on her work, which is uh, linked here. So brands are shorthand marketing messages. They create emotional connections and bonds with customers. They're composed of these intangible elements related to specific promise, personality, positioning, and intangible elements that we can identify. So things like the logos, the graphics, symbols, sounds, colors, right? The NBC bing, 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 like that kind of um, tangible and intangible connections. Um, and so brand creates this perceived value for uh, consumers through its personality in the way that it stands out versus other products. Um, all right, let's go to the next slide. Um, I also wanna take a moment to talk about this quote that probably we've encountered several times throughout our lives. Uh, build a better mousetrap and the world will beat a path to your door. This is a Ralph Waldo Emerson quote. Uh, so the problem with this quote is that if you actually go back and look at what Ralph said, it was a much longer quote, it's been shortened here. And what he really was saying was, when all things are equal and you and your neighbor have a very similar product, you have a higher quality, someone will beat a path to your door. So we're gonna toss this quote out entirely because it's really not true. This is sort of misleading in the way it's usually used to say, well, if I have a really great product, customer will find me. In 2021, that is just not true, right? We know that in the pandemic, the retailers that won were those that served customers, right? That could really quickly pivot and get to them uh, what they needed just despite changing circumstances and new delivery and things of that nature. So um, how do we get the consumer to know what we're delivering? Um, for that, we're going to look to marketing guru, Seth Godin. So Seth has written, marketing is no longer about the stuff you make. It's about the stories you tell. And that's what we're going to focus on for this session. All right. So let's actually, you know, step back and think about brands over time. So what, what does this term brand even come from? Um, so cattle branding actually began in the U.S. about 400 years ago. This literally was an organization system. So I'm a farmer with my cattle, uh, with my you know, goats, whatever it might be, and they start wandering off the land. How do we identify what's mine and what's yours? So these iron brands were used to you know, create actual brands to identify which farmer, which family owned them. And this is something that had existed for thousands of years overseas prior to that. Um, but brand in a more modern sense started about 150 years ago. Um, in particular, brand was important, you know, right here virtually in Pittsburgh. Um, so H.J. Hines was a kind of a brand pioneer. So this bottle that we're looking at is a real life, you know, bottle of very early Heinz horseradish that was sold around the Pittsburgh area. So really, um, you know, take a look at this bottle. You may look at it, it looks old timey, right? Not, there isn't something that's in our, uh, our purview today that looks all that innovative about this bottle. Um, but there is something very innovative about this bottle. So in 1875, if you walk into the general store, 
you want to pick up horseradish. Uh, most bottled products at this point in time were actually put in opaque bottles. So green, blue, whatever. Um, they were a brand you'd never heard of before. They might say someone's name on them. They may not. They might just say horseradish in black lettering or no lettering at all. Um, maybe a little, you know, note or sign. And the problem with that was, you know, a homework girl would walk into the store. She may purchase horseradish. And that horseradish often had things like sawdust that was mixed into the recipe. The reason why was the manufacturer, the seller got to put a little bit of horseradish and put in, you know, essentially something that costs nothing at all, sell it. You know, they went from town to town on, on stagecoach or whatever. They sold it and that was it. So H.J. Hines did something pretty innovative and said, I make really high quality horseradish. The re how we're going to transmit that to these homemakers, we're going to put it in a, in a glass bottle. And so this, you know, at the advent of branding was something that really communicated trust. Um, you could see freshness color and you could see that there were no impurities in there. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that more in a moment. So the way that we today can really get to a good brand positioning is to use what's a really a very classic framework. Um, and I'm going to be sharing it with you over the next few slides. So this is uh, the framework in particular is called the brand positioning statement. And within the brand positioning statement, we're going to focus on four key things. Uh, first, the target market. So what group is most naturally motivated to buy the local grains that we are selling? Um, and in particular, we want to focus on this because, you know, as entrepreneurs, we often can say, we'll sell to anyone. Like we want to get our product out there. We know it's great. We sell to men, women from zero to 99. Uh, we, you know, or, or whatever their gender identity might be, we sell, you know, whoever. But that said, oftentimes our businesses are in particular circumstances that lend to geographic borders. Um, so in particular, I, I've worked with a company that's based, uh, that has a kiosk in the Pittsburgh airport, right? They could put on their brand positioning statement, we sell to anyone. But in reality, when you start peeling back the layers of the onion, they sell to people who are within the Pittsburgh airport because there's a physical gate connect, you know, preventing people that motivated people from getting there, right? If they wanted to visit this kiosk. So then you can go down and start thinking about needs, states of people in the airport, um, demographic data, things of that nature that really help you to set up your brand positioning and your message. Um, in particular, category frame of reference uh, would be the next element. So in what space are you competing? using that airport example. Um, this happens to be a food product as well. So they're looking at a lot of grab and go foods, maybe some gifts and things of that nature. Uh, rational or emotional benefit or promises next. And this is really the heart of the brand positioning statement. What you need to do here is think about what problem does my product solve for a consumer? So, you know, often we might say, well, I have the only grain that is from this particular town, or you can, you know, we take these very specific attributes and say, I'm the only one that does this. And that is a point of differentiation that may be very important, may be um, helpful and add trust to the local people that have it, but really to capture a, the heart or the buying power of a particular consumer, how are we making their life easier? How are we increasing their trust and so forth? And then finally, we're going to end with three reasons to believe that support that emotional benefit that we have created. Um, I know that at this stage, this probably, you know, seems a little foreign. So what we're going to do is take a couple of examples and look at each of these um, four attributes in terms of, uh, of specific brands. Okay. So um, again, let's, let's travel back in time, everyone. Um, congratulations, you've just been hired. Um, and we are on the brand team. We're sitting side by side around the table with H.J. Hines. It's 1875. Somehow we got this future tool, the brand positioning statement. And we're sitting around saying, you know what? How are we going to target our market? How is our Heinz horseradish going to best resonate? So Thinking about target market, again, we can say, well, well, we sell to everyone, we'll sell to everybody. But the reality is, um, even in 1875, we're starting to see retail stores pop up and things of this nature, right? Maybe a little door-to-door -door sales as well. Um, so when we think about who our target market is, we specifically are targeting homemakers um, in the greater Pittsburgh area. 
why homemakers? Because even at this point in time, um, we see, you know, women making a lot of the, the home decisions. Um, so horseradish for, you know, probably in the craft community, you guys are very well aware, but horseradish um, grows as a crop, it gets grated down, it gets pickled. It's a very laborious um, product to, you know, make and pickle for yourself and things of that nature. So this is um, something that, you know, homemaker women may want to buy so long as they can trust it. So she's buying this. Um, she's in the greater Pittsburgh area because that's where H.J. Heinz has started his company, right? Where this is sort of before widespread refrigeration. So great. We got it. We want to appeal to homemakers who in this, at this point in time are women in the greater Pittsburgh area. If someone passes through from Ohio, they want to buy it. Great. If a gentleman wants to come in and buy it, great. But the point here is that is not our primary target because that is not the group that would be most motivated to buy. This is who our messaging will be centered around. All right, so next, what are we selling, right? At large, we are selling condiments and sauces. Um, we, but really what specific, we know that there are other condiments and sauces, our stands for high quality. So we are the quality bottled horseradish within this category. And now, now we start getting to the really juicy parts. Um, what benefit do I get? Well, I have horseradish that I can put on my food. Yes, that would be a very rational benefit. But what we're really selling here, what HJ Hunt is really selling is the quality horseradish that you can trust, right? You can see it, you know, there's not impurities. Um, and then there's some other benefits that, that come from there. I'm gonna pause here just a second because I have not looked to see if any questions popped up <laughs> as I've been talking. So uh, just kind of mill over these for just a second. I'm not, actually, I don't think I can do that while I share slides. Rachel, you're good, there's nothing yet. Perfect. All right, let me get right back to it. Okay. And can everyone still see the slides? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so here we go. We're gonna get back to, you know, we, we have the, this quality horseradish for in the Pittsburgh area, you can trust it. Now, what, this, what comes next is really critical. Um, this next point is what are the supporting messages that are going to really drive home our emotional benefit? So, you know, going over what we learned when we looked at the actual horseradish model, really critically, it's made from quality ingredients because you can see them. You can see them through the glass bottles. No sawdust or fillers. This is a really important message. Second, it saves you time. We know that horseradish is tedious. It's grating. It takes time to pickle and so forth. This is done. This is something now you can trust. Uh, see it through the bottle. It saves you time. So you've got that convenience message as well. And then lastly, it's made right here in Pennsylvania. Uh, we know that for a couple of reasons. So thinking back to the slide where we saw the horseradish bottle, it actually has the keystone on there. So when you start thinking about these choices that were made, yes, HJ probably didn't have the, the uh, format we're looking at this through, but he or the people on his team made very specific choices to get across the message of trust and quality and local that we use today. And what, why I really love going through this example and talking about Heinz horseradish is if you think about that glass bottle, the shape and the keystone, yeah, we're talking about a product that was made 150 years ago, but does Heinz, does the brand Heinz really look all that different today when you walk into the grocery store? It truly doesn't. Yes, there are, there are new products that have been added, but Heinz still 150 years later is about quality, convenience, um, and for probably most of us on the call, it's about being made, you know, or, or based in Pennsylvania as well. Okay, great. So um, what we're gonna do next is go into another example. Um, this is a company that I have just made up. So um, I am the proprietor of Great Bear Farms Buckwheat. Um, and I, I wanna share uh, how, how you might do this. Hopefully it'll have a little bit of different resonance for, for everyone on the call. So, you know, Thinking about who I'm going to target, you know, again, I'm going to say, okay, I am a local uh, buckwheat farmer, um, producer, provider in Pennsylvania. So I am thinking, okay, 
just for reasons of logistics, delivery, uh, profit margin, all that stuff. My primary target is going to be these consumers, which could be either families or individuals who are in the Pittsburgh area. That's where I'm starting from. Um, so as I think through this, I'm saying, okay, so Graper Farms Buckwheat, we are the local buckwheat producer. And um, just to, to give a little more example, I'm thinking of a buckwheat producer that I'm going to make, I'm going to mill it to flour, and I'm also going to make some pretty much ready to use, um, but simple mixes like pancake mix it still needs, you know, eggs and milk and that sort of thing added to it. Um, so how do I differentiate myself from just saying buckwheat, buckwheat, you know, here you go. I'm going to be the brand. I want to position that, um, that our brand makes me feel good about what I'm eating or good about what I'm serving to my family. And why is that? So as I'm thinking through what the different criteria I have to use is, saying, okay, well, buckwheat is naturally gluten-free. So that's going to be a primary message that we're about supporting health. Um, health can be a little bit of a tricky message because some people define health in terms of low sugar, some define it in terms of, you know, whole grains. So you want to be um, sensitive with this message. Words like wholesome also work. Um, but in this particular case, we're going to say promotes health because it's gluten-free and buckwheat also has some research to support that it um, reduces inflammation and supports overall health. Secondarily, we're going to say um, this brand has been trusted by restaurants in the area, right? So not only would we be using this message in a commercial way, but we'd also be making it a priority for our team internally to go and create partnerships with local restaurants. So this is something that would actually help us get more brand awareness and also be something that, that fits our overall message. Um, and then finally, just like H.J. Uh, Hines, our buckwheat is grown and milled here on our family farm in Western Pennsylvania, just as it has been for three generations. So this is just one example of how you can, you know, build a narrative and make sure that you hit these same sorts of message messages over and over again through your marketing ex executions. Okay, great. So we're going to move on next. And what I want to do is really talk about you know, getting back to that. What's the difference between brand and what's the difference in marketing? Um, this is a slide I put together that thinks that I think really helps to um, illuminate that. So if we think just about brand and again, think about the Heinz brand and how the brand itself has not really changed from 1875 to Heinz catch up today. Um, brand is something that really rarely ever changes. There could be a small evolution, but your brand is pretty much omnipresent from the day you, you know, you open your company to the end. Um, so it's the essence of what you do. Uh, so in, and I'm going to go through an example here in just a moment, uh, a messaging campaign might be, okay, you know, we were selling Heinz horseradish for many years, then they added relish and they added whatever the sauces were of the day that were relevant. Today they do ketchup, then some of us remember the purple ketchup. So as they have new product introductions, they may have specific campaigns that point to these specific products, but sort of the essence of what those products represent, the brand remains the same. Um, sometimes you see companies start sub-brands or different brands because they want to communicate a totally separate idea. And then finally, marketing executions are these very tangible things that we do. So um, I'm going to walk you through an example, um, just looking at these uh, images here on the right side. Um, so I chose this brand, Heisler Beer. This is a fake beer brand, uh, often used on sitcoms and things that, that you may have watched in the past, if, you, if you've heard this name. So let's say we're Heisler, and let's say we happen to be a local beer brand, right, using local grains. Um, we know that the way we communicate this brand, the tangible logo, uh, the feeling of how we deliver and communicate to customers, that's always going to stay the same. Um, and perhaps we have a, a, an ale that we sell 365 days a year. Um, well, we may also have seasonal beers. So if we have, I've just made up some uh, beer names here on the right hand side as well. But if we have a fall beer, a winter beer, spring and a summer, then more likely than not, we might have, we might use those four seasonal beers to really communicate newness in our brand throughout the year, right? So we may have a campaign around each of those. That campaign could show up in different marketing executions. Let's say we have a billboard that's right outside of our production facility or outside of the farm from which, you know, our hops, hops come from. We could then 
say, as part of our campaign, we're going to change the billboard every year. That's going to be one of the executions of that campaign. That's the lowest level execution of the campaign for that brand. So that is how they are all sort of interrelated. Um, I wanted to bring up this example in particular, because sometimes I hear, you know, when people are trying to invest more in marketing, they're trying to drive more um, consumers, they say, you know, it's someone told me that I need to be on TikTok, right? Okay, maybe you do need to be on TikTok. That could be a good piece of information. But it's not really, you don't really start with the marketing execution. The best way you're going to get the most bang for your buck, whether you're spending a lot in marketing or not, or trying to do, you know, organic marketing, is do you have a brand that is clearly hitting different marketing campaigns that are communicating what you want to communicate? And then you get down to, should it be on TikTok? Should it be on Instagram? Can I just, can I, is doing farmer's markets and getting out and shaking the hands of people that are interested in the product, is that enough? That might be. So once you've defined who you're targeting, you know, and all the stuff that we outlined in the brand positioning statement, then you're going to be able to get down to what are the marketing executions for you. <clears throat> Pardon me. And then we'll talk about that um, a little bit more at the end of today's presentation and, and the hour we have tomorrow. Okay. Um, so I was teaching a, a, a previous brand seminar and the question arose, is your brand what you say it is, or is it what the customer says that you are, right? And this is a really interesting question. Um, I found a quote to answer this that I really like. Um, the customer's perception is your reality. <laughs> so it is what you say it is, but moreover, your brand is what the customer says it is. However, we have ways, we have some really strategic ways to influence what the customer says. If we're following the brand positioning statement, and we're really being thoughtful about the brand we want to reflect. And we're using the same mottos and phrases. And uh, we've trained our staff that's you know, handing over our product. We've integrated our marketing messaging. We can have a tremendous influence on what our customer says it is. But it is about us communicating a really clear message. <clears throat> OK, so one thing that I really like as far as, as an insight challenge that helps again with the brand positioning statement is really put yourself in the shoes of the customer. Think about all the demands of their life, right? What is that solution that you're offering that's making their life a little easier? And again, maybe we'll go back to our example of I'm the only one that, that um, provides buckwheat in Wexford, Pennsylvania, right? Great. That's not a, a bad thing. That's a good reason to believe and things like that. But that itself is not our emotional promise to the customer. That might be a reason to believe because it's local. It makes me feel part of my community. But there needs to be ways that we serve them in terms of convenience, trust, loyalty, things like that. That's the way we help solve problems in their lives um, you know, versus these specific benefits. Um, so one example I, I like because I know some of you are participating in grain boxes and CSA type things. Um, you know, an insight for a grain box might be when it comes to baking, I want to make new recipes. I want them to be delicious, new, exciting, like broaden my horizons, but I don't have the time to research recipes, get a lot of very unique ingredients. So you may have, um, hey, it's going to be this delicious seasonal, you know, recipe. It's going to have a flour that I make and things like that. And maybe it has I don't know, two tablespoons of amaranth or something that's you know, not in your average kitchen cabinet. When you're thinking about creating a grain box, you might be selling the five pounds of the grain that you provide, but you might include a recipe. You might include these couple of unique ingredients because what you're really selling, the emotional benefit of what you are selling to this customer is this convenience and really meeting this emotional need of theirs. So they're willing to pay a little bit more. Um, in order to make all those things happen. All right. <clears throat> Another thing I want to touch on just really briefly is thinking about the character of who your brand is. Um, we don't have enough time to really dig deeply into this today, but you know, take time when you're driving somewhere, you can be kind of performing your activity, but thinking elsewhere, like if my brand were a person, what would they be? Do they have a voice that's more masculine? Is it more feminine? Is it completely uh, neutral? Are they wise and experienced? Um, think of the Dos Equis guy, right? The most interesting man in the world. 
they did not choose a feminine or youthful brand character, right? You can literally think about who that brand character might be. The brand character is not you. Um, it's more the essence of, you know, there's a, there's a bunch of silly exercises you can do. If your brand walks into a bar, what do they order, right? Do they order a beer? Do they order a glass of wine? Do they, well, you know, we're a very healthy brand. We don't drink at all, do they, you know, or religiously uh, affiliated, all that stuff. Um, but you really want to think about that. And, and if I can emphasize one point here, it's that for most brands, when you're speaking as the brand, whether it's on social media, on a brochure, uh, whatever it might be, for 90% of, of brands, um, farms, whatever, you want to speak in a we plural voice. Um, the re and I want to emphasize that in particular, because I think some brands tend to speak as I, right? Like it was crazy to get the orders out this week, but I finally, you know, I pulled it off or whatever. That's it's a very personal message to put on, on uh, social media, right? You can have messages about, um, you know, we are so excited about the volume of orders this week. Let's keep growing, you know, together. We're glad to be paired with you for, to meet all your family's holiday needs, things of that nature. A uh, we is usually a better brand um, personality, brand, you know, voice. Um, there are some exceptions to that. So we were in a brand session right now. We were talking about how to market uh, tax accounting services. Well, tax accountants, real estate agents, these are people that probably should speak with I when they're speaking as their brand, because they're really talking about um, messages of trust and delivery and things of that nature. Um, but for our kinds of brands, just something I wanted to emphasize and happy to answer any questions about that at the end of today's session or tomorrow. All right, just a few more slides. Um, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this slide, but as you start thinking about these executions of how you express the brand, it's things like your name. So it can be Graper Family Farms or it can be Dream Come True Farms, right? These have diff evoke different sort of messages. So Dream Come True Farms might have a backstory about this is the realization of our dream. We wanna, keep you and your family, you know, healthy or fed or whatever, so you can reach your dreams. Graper Family Farms is going to be a different kind of a family message, most likely. Neither one is right or wrong. They lend to different types of narratives. Um, of course, some expressions of the brand are your logos or key symbols that you might use. Um, you can find some free icons and things at some of the uh, links that I've provided here. Um, also, it'll help to organize your brand if you use the same fonts over and over again, something you want to think about. Again, I've linked some resources um, in sort of imagery. You want to make sure that your imagery stays within one particular style, or at least there are specific styles that are relating to different things that you are communicating. Um, and, and color palette as well is very important. Um, you know, one thing to keep in mind is that we are at a, as you all know, we have had a, a big turning point. We've had a lot change um, in our economy over the last year and a half. And consumers are rewarding those companies that are meeting their needs, right? We talked very, we touched very briefly on grocery delivery. The companies we've seen really succeed are those that pivoted, that allowed goods in whatever category they were to get to consumers. Um, and so for that reason, and for all the other reasons and ways technology is changing, you know, your brand, particularly your website and how it shows up online is the new front door of your business more so than a physical location as it has been for generations, right? And that's a really important point to think about. Um, so Hootsuite, a digital provider, had a report that I pulled some data from and it said, in the last month, over 50% of people have visited a brand's website, right? We know it's probably even more than that. And, um, you know, so in my opinion, my best advice is to say, if you have a brand of any size at any stage, at minimum, you need a website that is your new front door. It can be a one page website that just says one paragraph about what you do or what the hours are or the season where you provide your, your product, that's fine. Um, better to have one really well-designed, well, you know, with great communication web page than to have a poorly designed 20 page website. That's going to go against your branding goals. Um, also some kind of presence on Instagram or Facebook, even again, if you post once a month, something that communicates your, uh, against your brand positioning. I put Instagram slash Facebook, because in this case, um, you know, Instagram and Facebook are now one company. So you could really, you know, 
create Instagram content and say, I wanted to post to Facebook as well and only have to deal with one interface if you wanted to do a low investment. Um, and then finally, whatever you're selling, whether it's a beer, it's a flower, it's, you know, I'm sure there's all sorts of other uh, green products I'd like to hear about from you all. Um, you need to have some sort of professionally designed label to connect with the customer, right? Because a professional designer is gonna make a lot of choices based on that brand positioning and what we have communicated to them that's going to have a psychological appeal to consumers. Um, hey, there are exceptions to every rule. There are really gorgeous, emotionally connecting labels that have been designed by amateurs, um, but professional design exists for a reason. And if it were me, and it has been me in the past, um, you know, in fact, I, professional design really takes uh, granola. This is my ideal grain-free granola and helps you have your brand jump off the shelf, off the table at the farmer's market, um, even a, a box or something that's mailed to them and really communicate a lot of things. As they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. This is important. All right, so we are we're substantially through the presentation today, but I wanna leave um, some time for Q&A at the end, but first, just lean into what we're gonna talk about. Marketing is gonna be our topic for tomorrow. So we're just gonna set um, two or three slides to, to kind of set the table about what we'll be discussing then or what might help um, our conversation. So tomorrow we'll talk about marketing local grains. Now that we've established really who we're targeting, what emotional benefit um, that our brand brings to a consumer and how we're making their lives a little bit easier, better, more convenient, um, now we're going to talk about how do we market it, right? So now we've set the stage. Now what do we do? Um, marketing is really this really broad discipline. Um, and, but traditionally, there are three primary goals that you're trying to achieve. One is brand awareness. So customer can't buy your product. They never heard of it, right? So brand awareness can be things like, you know, just getting the product out there for the first time. It also can include things like, um, goodwill. So this is more like when you've seen that third Coca-Cola commercial of the day and you think how much money does Coke have to spend, you know, on billboards, on advertisements and things of this nature. Well, what Coca-Cola is trying to do is really get goodwill, right? They want to be there at the, with the sports teams that you like. They want to remind you of Coke. So you say, oh, maybe I will grab a Diet Coke at lunch. That sort of goodwill measures. Um, second, lead generation is a classic goal as well. So lead generation is going to be why we get barraged with emails all the time now. And it's um, lead generation is why you get referral bonuses from your favorite companies. Hey, recommend to your friend that they should try this as well. You, you know, said that you really love this. This is because um, lead generation is going to help lead to a more certain sale, a higher possibility of sale. And then, of course, our favorite marketing goal, revenue, right? That's the, the most um, popular thing we're driving to. But these others, brand awareness and lead generation help lead to revenue as well. So specifically, I also want to talk to you all about the marketing funnel. Um, marketing funnel is, is a, a kind of in vogue way to think about marketing. It's, um, it's really taking classic marketing principles and just putting them in a new framework. Um, but what I think is important is that it captures marketing down to the revenue level, whether it comes through digital sources or um, traditional in-person sales, uh, you know, that we've had in the past. So when we want to think about this, you know, there's, there's another um, classic way to think about marketing that's called the buyer's journey. So again, awareness, no one can buy from your brand if they don't know about your brand, they don't know about your product. Consideration is that stage where we're doing research or we're tasting the product for the first time. It's so whatever information we're going to get to gather to make that purchase decision. And then finally, we follow through with purchase, right? At any point, you could exit the journey or hopefully, you, you know, you keep going and this leads to a sale. So the marketing funnel really follows exactly this trajectory as well. It's about attracting customers first. It's about enabling evaluation and then finally leading to purchase or uh, in a the purchase is now typically more called conversion, right? Because we know certain digital properties, you actually don't pay money, right? But you do get that content. Um, you do join a service that now sells your data, <laughs> you know, privacy stuff. Um, and so when we're talking about the marketing funnel, when we're talking more about that awareness state, we're calling it top of the funnel. 
middle of funnel are these evaluation criteria and bottom of the funnel is conversion purchase. And in just a couple of examples of what this can look like, uh, this is not to suggest that all of these are relevant uh, for the, your brands, right? But things like out of home advertising, that's gonna, again, get that attracting customers. So that could be a billboard, that could be a flyer that you know you take and staple onto a telephone pole near your house, right? Any kind of awareness out of home. Um, it can be public relations. It can be podcasts. Um, to a certain degree, it's search engine optimization uh, when you're doing it organically, and so on and so forth. Um, as we go through middle of the funnel, um, this is why we see all these review sites and things. Why we see on um, even on a website where we can make purchase that there's a lot of content to sort of lead us to that purchase. That is trying to get people through the funnel and through the evaluation stage. That's what FAQ pages are for on websites, um, you know, and so on and so forth. And finally, at bottom of the funnel, this is the conversion stage. So you may have a really great group of customers that is buying from your website. Um, and you think like, I have some limited edition or limited amount of this. I'm going to email this group of customers, a special deal. It's going to actually help get, you know, feelings of loyalty and goodwill and that sort of thing. But it's actually going to help, you know, sell this product and convert them because I know that these customers already like my brand. They just, you know, they're already more toward the bottom of the funnel and I get need to motivate them to keep going. All right. So that is going to conclude the prepared slides that I have today. Um, I'm happy to dive in and answer any questions. So I hand it back over to Kala and uh, yeah, happy to engage. All right, thank you so much, Rachel. I already went through these slides of you, you know, behind the scenes last week, but I feel like I already learned uh, something new. Well, great. Yeah, um, so while we're waiting on people to, oh, we got a question. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Jonathan wants to know, is it better to build a brand on a person or a family name or on something more general? Uh, yeah, that, that's a really great question, Jonathan. And it, it's tough. I would say, it's hard to say, is it better or is it worse? I would say there, there are positives and negatives to each of them. Um, when I was building Ideal, which I um, held up just for a second, I've worked on various food brands before and I felt that I could have, like, and a lot of people said to me, why don't you call it like, Rachel's granola or, you know, grape or goodness, grain free granola, whatever. But having worked on like a number of food brands before, that just didn't feel right to me. And I'll tell you why, like I have worked at companies where we made jelly as, a, as an example, jelly cups, and there was a mold problem, you know, every now and then, right? And like to have it be, let's say that was my company, to have that associated, like you give so much of your heart and soul to a brand, <laughs> to your own company, to have my name on it as well. Like I felt like I needed more separation despite, I don't want to be misleading at all, despite having every commitment to health and quality and safety. Um, that's just the way life goes. So for me, that wasn't right. Um, I also think that just my personal taste lead toward, I happen to prefer not my professional opinion that's better, but you know, Rachel as a private citizen, I like brands that have this like evocative emotional names. So I liked calling it ideal because it's like people kind of get like, oh, you know, you you don't know everything about the brand, but you look at it and the idea of like the product design of this was, oh, ideal. So it must, you know, it's probably healthier. And I'm also getting that there's this like craft paper type thing. Um, my designer in particular, by the way I described the brand, she made these like sort of extra pieces around that don't look too messy. So it looks like muddy, but she really wanted to get across, um, you know, that it was sort of natural and organic and like just that there is a mix of a slanted letter and a big and small, like this is something more authentic. We're not, you know, there's a reason why Gucci and Prada have like you know, black and white and very pre uh, precise letters because they're trying to get across. This is very precisely designed. This is more like, this is stuff you wanna eat and it's delicious and we take it seriously, but that's not the positioning. Um, so more specifically with that question, you know, I think it all goes with, um, if I had a family farm that I inherited and like I was, I wanted to, pay tribute to my grandfathers and be able to tell our family story. 
I'd be much more likely to lean toward a family name, um, something like that. Um, but if, you know, you just want to, and, and you want to do that the rest of your life, you know, in my case, when I started the granola business, I really thought, well, maybe I'll grow this business and I will sell it. Maybe that would have been wonderful if it became a national brand and I sold it to Kellogg's or whatever, you know, post or some food company, not the way things went. Right. But to have my brand be owned by somebody else, I, I couldn't have had my, my name on it. And, and it didn't really meet my business goals at the time. So kind of relating to that question, uh, if you do choose to go with the uh, family name or like rooting it in a local place, yeah. how, and this might be a more marketing question, but how yeah. do you get consumers to care about the local through your branding? Um, the, is that your question, Kala? Yeah, are you, that's, that's okay. my yeah. yeah, I want to understand the last part of it. Like um, the, how do you get them to care about like, the. I guess in maybe terms of conversion, like if somebody is, um, if somebody is like looking at something and they see some of the different uh, yeah. pain points that you mentioned, like it's healthy, it's convenient, that kind of thing. What about the local do you think drives people into making a purchase? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And now I understand. So it's interesting because um, I had started this brand ideal when I was still working um, in New York City and I relocated to Pittsburgh, I brought the whole company with me. We moved production and everything. And in New York City, like there's a lot of local companies, but like it's an enormous place. Like local is not a message that resonates. Right. Um, I started selling, um, so I actually have, I have several bags next to me. This one features, um, I'm gonna try to hold it there, a local sticker, right? Local Pittsburgh PA. Um, and it's because when I had moved the production facility um, and I went into, I think like East End Co-op in particular, I was like a really great partner of mine. Um, and I also sold in, in the Whole Foods in the local area. Uh, several grocery managers said to me like, so you're local, right? Okay, great. Can you put something low? Can you add local to the bag? You know, and I already had pre-printed bags and as we all have a million priorities, I was like, I don't think so. <laughs> but literally I got Avery labels from Staples and I ran these through, you know, a color printer and for eight cents a piece or whatever, I put, I had a two version of a small bag as well. And I put these on all the bags. Um, Cause that's a really great question, Kala, because sometimes we are so embedded and I've been guilty of it too. We're so embedded in our brands and we know that it came from the honey. The honey came from the farm down the road and we've done all this stuff that we actually forget to emphasize this with our customers. Right. So that's another way the, the brand positioning framework can help you because you can say one of our virtues is local. Right. So that is the um, that's always going to be a message of the brand. But the way you execute that might be different. Right. So it might be um, Callous Honey is down the street. So I want to make sure. So as I'm always looking at that brand positioning framework, I'm like, OK, it's uh, it's National Honey Day. So I'm going to talk to you or your team ahead of time. And I'm going to say, I'm going to do a post that says, you know, honey appreciation day. We partner with, with uh, palace honey. We ask your team to, to feature us as well too. So we have that execution through our online channels and social media. Um, maybe when we're saying, you know, the local sticker can only have so much information, but um, in, I was in giant Eagle market district with the granola and they often had a little um, card or they had, uh, a feature in their newsletter and things like that. So these are ways you want to repeat those messages again and again. Like we're not just local because we are here. We partner with Calus Honey. We come, you know, partner with company B, C, and D. Sometimes with us, because we see every execution, we think oh, I just keep saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, you know, my grandmother shops at a giant Eagle Market district. She's not on social media, right? So you you need to yes, find new ways to maybe emphasize these stories so it's not cookie cutter. But when you're talking about different channels, you need to make sure the messages go, you know, flow, flow through many channels. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my next question is, what strengths do you think that local food producers have when branding their products? And then what weaknesses have you seen? Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, I think, you know, going back to that, like Ralph Waldo Emerson quote, it's like all other things equal, you mm -hmm. know, people will build about to path to your door if it's better. It's like all other things equal, people want local, right? Um, 
So I think people want to be connected to their community. I think it is a huge advantage if people have the opportunity to meet you or even to see your face. Like farmers markets were not my primary sales channel. Like they really, I did several and maybe the first or second time I went out in a year, I would sell a lot when it was a brand new product. Um, but I would do most of the volume for my products through Giant Eagle Market District, through Whole Foods, places like that. Um, I also want to mention that I had a, a small one ounce bag of granola that sold at Coffee Tree Roasters, um, which has six locations in the Pittsburgh area. That also was not a huge money maker for me. Um, however, it was reliable sales. And after I got that um, relationship going, I ran into people all the time and said, I know ideal granola, or, I said they, or even I met them before. Mm -hmm. Like, you yeah. have, I mean, I did have some people working for me, but it was funny, but I think people would say, I've seen it, right? I walk in to get a coffee and in most locations at coffee roasters, it was seated right next to where you paid and got your coffee. That was like a tremendous um, brand awareness active, you know, um, tactic for the, the brand that I had not really set up that way. So you may want to also think about that. Like it really helps people feel connected to the community, even if they only buy or you know, maybe they buy coffee at Coffee Tristers every day, they buy it once a month. That's a huge advantage. Mm -hmm. um, disadvantages, um, there are definitely some disadvantages. I would say, I had one a minute ago and just flew out of my brain. <laughs> but, you know, sometimes, I think I might have uh, mentioned this to Cala behind the scenes too, but like sometimes people would ask very silly questions to me, um, thinking that they were like, they say, oh, you know, someone would walk up to me in like a very crunchy outlet that I was in and I was doing sampling and they'd say, is this all local? Because I only eat local. Like, oh, okay. Um, you know, great. Good. Like, good for you. We all should be eating local. Um, are your nuts local? Are your cashews local? Definitely and, not. Yeah. Cashews are not local, right? Because they pretty much, you know, as far as I know, and I've grown in the United States. So they'd ask like kind of a question that was a little ignorant and, um, even things that are like a little more nuanced. So I bought honey from a local PA producer, but I used a, an organic honey. And, um, you know, maybe there are some honey producers here. So it's very, it's nearly impossible, again, to get organic honey in the United States. And the reason why is, you know, a bee can fly 300 miles. And so, you know, what land can you find that is not 300 miles, you know, from an, an inorganic source, right? So you can't call it Organic. So actually most organic honey and the kind that I bought was from Brazil, but it gets bought by a company in Lancaster from Brazil and it's Pennsylvania organic honey, right? So sometimes it actually feels a little weird because I could really um, honestly answer it is PA honey because I believe it was processed in PA. I bought it directly from that manufacturer. It was in, in the state. Um, but it's a little murky like that. Those things are a little murky. And I've also worked myself with some other producers that say, oh, we, we source everything here. If I don't, if I don't get it from the place, I go to the Walmart on the street. It's like, well, you know, the Walmart, <laughs> you might be sourcing it locally at your Walmart, but it's not a, mm -hmm. their sources are from all around the world. So I think, you know, I think it's like anything else. We want to go directionally toward local, toward doing what we can, but the reality is we are in a very internationally connected world, right? So eat more organic, eat more local. Um, that, that's sort of how I live my life. Uh, try to do your best, but you know, there's right. only so much local for certain, <laughs> certain items, yeah. So we do have another question and it kind of ties into uh, something that I've seen a lot of uh, businesses that maybe aren't direct to consumer. Notice yeah. like, how do you, how do you brand that? So Jonathan wants to know, like, if, if he sells flour to bakeries or breweries, would it be good to give them ways to help them tell the story to their customers? Like he says, maybe include a card in the order with points on the history and benefits of the wheat or something along those lines. Like, to what extent do you think that that kind of thing is helpful in, in branding your, your regional grain? Yeah. Yeah. So I can answer that a few different ways. So if all like assuming that all the flour goes through secondary points right and they're going to do something honestly probably putting a card in that's going to go to the restaurant manager or whatever probably is not going to hit as much because they're in just like a different need state like a different psychological state of mind when they open it or it's going to be opened by someone in the back that just puts everything on on the racks for later use um but 
that that said, I think there's a lot of opportunities for partnership. So even being a behind the scenes producer, you still could say, um, you could do those basics, create a, a Facebook page. Like, I assume that you're having some email orders with this restaurant personnel. So again, let's call it R Graper family, you know, farms buckwheat. So if it's Graper farms buckwheat, I'm still gonna have an email where someone's gonna be reaching out to me, I'm gonna be sending an invoice. So I would go to Google and do, uh, you know, Gmail, I should say, and like buy my $6 a month email. That's Rachel at Graper farms, you know, dot com. I'd get the Graper farms Instagram, lock down that name, Graper farms, uh, Facebook as well. Again, one account, very easy to manage. And I'd go to GoDaddy or Google domains and I'd buy greatperforms.com. If only you have, you know, a picture of the farm and if only on Instagram, you post once a month, that would be enough to, it's really more like a sign that you care to your customers because at the end of the day, those grocery managers, restaurant managers, whatever it might be, they are still consumers, right? So you, I, I don't think you need to go way overboard with, with your branding, especially if you don't have a consumer message today. I think you need to have enough there that it shows that you care, that you have pride, that you've done the work to make those connections. Um, and then from there, I think you also could do some work like that's a little more, um, little more work on the front end and go, when you make that first delivery, you make that sale and you shake hands with that manager, you say, you know what, we are so proud to be here do you mind if we put this on our Instagram page? Do you have a picture you want us to put? Would you guys cross promote? Would you promote that you're proud of us and we promote that we're proud of you? Because when you do those simple things, they might have, you know, 10,000, 50,000 followers with whatever they're doing. And one post, you know, might only lead to 1% of people taking a look at what you do, but that might be, you know, hundreds more impressions and 10% of them follow you. Well, now you've got 50 followers, right? Now you have opportunities to start building your brand um, but of course, as an entrepreneur, you know, be efficient in what you spend your time doing. There's just some smart ways, I think, that you can start managing your brand and start bolstering that even when you're totally B2B. Well, it looks like we have about uh, three minutes left. Um, I don't see any more uh, questions in the chat. So I have, I have one. Okay. Uh, and so <laughs> I, uh, I've been running a startup, uh, program through craft, uh, right. and we had, and we were talking about social media last week. And one of our, um, one of our participants was talking about how they followed a account selling something very similar to what they sold. And they visited that place on a trip where they had like their son go visit it. And they were very disappointed in the, uh, in the substance. Oh. And, um, so I guess my question is, and, and so, and so this person was very discouraged about social media and branding. It's like, why bother when people are do, having this incredible branding with a substandard product? Like, how can I get Interesting. my out there? Um, so like, what would you say to people who, to, uh, you know, bakers, to regional grain producers who are maybe discouraged about the importance of branding to their product? Yeah. Well, you know, it's, my first reaction is it's interesting that they're discouraged by that because I would be encouraged <laughs> one, you know, I, I'm all about fairness and honesty. So it's, it's unfortunate to hear that, but it's also, if anything, you could also turn that around the other way and say, well, if you can make, if you can shine up that rotten apple and make it look nice, like right. think of my high quality product and how much it can resonate with consumers, you know? Um, but unfortunately, I mean, there's always going to be false advertising and online dating, selling your cookies, <laughs> baking bread, you know, whatever it might be. Um, there's always going to be false advertising and we can't unfortunately control the behavior of others. But um, I think social media is really, I would think of it more like social media is an opportunity. Most brands, you know, despite all the big brands we looked at and talked about, mm -hmm. most businesses and brands do not have a dollar to advertise. Like that's what branding is about. Um, I mean, whether you have $50 million to advertise or $50 in an annual basis, you need to have a strong brand either way, because, you know, the reason we all, you know, have drink and eat too much sugar, right? Is that these companies are really effective, right? And they, they deliver fun experiences. Um, but in any case, like 
I think branding and social media in particular, especially on a local basis, I really think you have an opportunity to advertise for free, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe taking a lot of your time. And, and I think you have to be very choiceful about how you deploy that and which channels you do. Um, and in particular, I'm taking that from um, some people that I've worked with on an individual basis. It's like, I just heard about TikTok. I just heard about clubhouse chats. I just heard about, you're never gonna keep up with every channel, um, including the, you know, the professionals and people that have bigger budgets to do it. Um, that's just never going to work. So what you need to do is go after what's the story I want to tell to, to whom am I going to tell it? And then what are the most effective channels to reach them? Um, you know, I mentioned Facebook and Instagram, particularly for social, because they're just the biggest. I mean, Instagram for my money is the most impactful, least um, investment of time that you need to do. Mm -hmm. Um, there's also, you know, we can talk about it more tomorrow, but there's also a number of, um, social media services now, like Hootsuite, one is called later.com. Um, these are places where you can upload all of your um, images that you've collected in advance, schedule posts. Um, both of them have free programs. So if you're posting less than 30 times a month, there's no fee to use it at all. As you, you know, go on and get more professional and want, want to pre-schedule video and so forth, there's like small incremental amounts um, without even putting dollars behind, right? To, to boost things on Facebook or whatever. Um, that can really help you get efficiency out of your social media. But, you know, more on that tomorrow, I guess. To be continued. Yes. Uh, well, thank you so much, Rachel. Uh, I think Cassandra has some stuff to say at the end, but uh, this was a, a talking. Yeah, I, I just wanted to thank you both. This was such a great conversation and uh, we really appreciate it. We can't wait to continue this tomorrow. Great. Thank you both. Thanks for everyone that joined today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all. We'll see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Thanks.